Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. We've got a few more on the way through. Um, we'll kick off with introductions. I'll start. I'm Andy Agathangelo, the founder of the Transparency uh, Task Force. Uh, I think you all know this, but just in case there's any doubt, we are a large, growing, influential organisation that is dedicated to helping to promote reform of the financial services sector. We, we take the work that we do very, very seriously. Uh, we operate through 19 different groups, and one of our groups is called Pisces. It's actually one of our largest groups, and Pisces stands for the following. The P stands for purposefulness. We believe the finance sector needs to embrace a real sense of purpose. Unfortunately, over the years, the finance sector has made making profit in the short term its priority, that's become its purpose. But of course, we all understand that that is the road to ruin. Uh, the I stands for impact investing. We believe there ought to be more impact investing and more effective impact investing. The S stands for sustainability, obviously. The C for climate change, obviously. The E for ESG. We believe that ESG is tremendously important and we want to help accelerate the rate at which corporates around the world, SMEs around the world, everybody around the world moves to a state of greater environmental awareness, social awareness and governance awareness. And the last S is for socially responsible investing, which I know is a hugely important topic to many of you. We're now going to move into introductions. Um, we're gonna go in the following order. We're going to go Anne-Marie, Johnny, Alison. Um, and then there'll be another batch after that. So Anne-Marie, Johnny and Alison, please prepare to very, very briefly and very, very succinctly introduce are yourselves. Yeah, we are on one, of the, one of the most beneficial things we do is we connect people through meetings like this and in many, many other ways. So I encourage all of you to make extensive use of the chat to, for example, provide your contact details, email address, LinkedIn profiles, Whatever goes in the chat is going to be circulated afterwards. Please do make use of it. I'm sure you're going to make some useful new contacts uh, this evening. I say this evening, it's this evening for most of us, uh, for at least one of you it's not. Um, so the other bit of housekeeping is we are recording. Uh, we might use some or all of this video in some way. So please make sure that you uh, only say what you want to share with the rest of the world. A simile on the topic of sharing with the rest of the world, please do use Twitter and LinkedIn as extensively as you can to help get the word out there. My colleague um, Alexandra will put into the chat our Twitter hand handle in just a moment. And if you want to also put your Twitter handle into the chat, then if you say something interesting and we want to tweet it, we can, of course, tag you as well. OK, I hope that sets the scene reasonably well. We're going to go Anne-Marie, uh, Johnny, Alison. So, Anne-Marie, please do unmute yourself and uh, briefly introduce yourself to everybody on the session. Thank you. OK, I'm Anne-Marie Borg. I'm a half French, half Swedish. I live in London. I have a university degree in business, international and maritime law. Uh, and I'm the founder of the Ampara project, which focuses on change in education system uh, via creativity and uh, uh, aiming for change altogether to empower the young people to actually face the change which are coming to them. Uh, I'm also a speaker for uh, ocean preservation. Fantastic, Anne-Marie. And Anne-Marie is very, very involved with TTF on many levels. So great to have you with us again, Anne-Marie. <laughs> we now go to Johnny. Johnny attended one of our events a week or two ago, and we had a lovely conversation together one-on-one -on -one the other day. Uh, really interesting guy. Johnny, please do introduce yourself. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. I think that's a better introduction than I'll do. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Johnny. I'm Scottish. I live in London currently. Uh, I was a nano, nano fabrication engineer, academic and industrial for about 10 years. Uh, now I am kind of retraining to be a social scientist at UCL uh, by a part time master's. Uh, in the rest of my time, I helped to run a urban agriculture organization that's connecting the industry in the UK. And I uh, do a little bit of uh, uh, environmental-centric angel investing um, when I when I can. 
Wonderful stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Alexandra, could you please arrange for Johnny and Stefan to be connected by email? I think it's worth the two of them having a conversation. My instincts tell me you might get on quite well. Um, Stefan will be introducing himself shortly. Uh, thanks, Johnny. Uh, let's now go to Alison. Thank you, Alison. Hello, um, I'm Alison. I'm David's wife, who's also on the Zoom. Um, like David, very keen on eco. I've got my own catering business right. um, and try and use as much sustainable produce as I can. Um, we live on a farm and are trying to do as much as we can up here and promote sustainability. Alison, that's lovely to hear. I wish I lived on a farm. My <laughs> idea would be to live on a farm next to, next to the sea. That would be my perfection. Uh, Alison, what part of the country are you in? Staffordshire. Yeah, Staffordshire. What a lovely part of the Sorry, country. the cat's joining in as well. Okay. <laughs> Hello, cat. Uh, let's now go to Arta. Arta, please introduce yourself. Then we'll have Julian, then Jacqueline, then Rebecca, then Stefan. Yes. Hello. Thank you, Andy. Uh, hello, everybody. I am um, talking now from the Netherlands, from Haarlem. Can you hear me well, by the way? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I will be talking later, so just maybe summarizing that I am the director of Ecopreneur, the European Federation of Sustainable Business, representing uh, 3,000 um, sustainable SMEs and also about 100 larger companies. I'm also um, working as a trainer for um, circular design, uh, training SMEs and larger companies uh, and some other things. I'm a, an independent uh, um, professional. Wonderful to have you with us, Arthur. I've got very vivid memories of our first very long and very constructive telephone conversation some time ago. Thanks, Arthur. That was pre-COVID, if I remember rightly. Yes, it was. Um, lovely. Let's now go to Mr. Julian Todd. Hi, Julian. Thanks, Andy, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm Julian Todd. I'm based in Birmingham, uh, although I'm not a Brummie, as you can tell. I have uh, an engineering and science and systems background and um, various hats, some of which will come into play tonight. Um, I'm a retired health informatics consultant, so I know quite a lot about big, hairy change programs. Um, I'm a very active climate campaigner in the city and the region. And I have just formed a company um, to develop a project I've been working on and off for many years to develop a, um, a new type of human electric hybrid vehicle. So um, I've got some perspective on what it takes to innovate, if you like. Um, and I've uh, been very active in what the Birmingham City and the Regional Authority have been doing on climate, which for people like me, it's frustratingly little, but it's it's all a learning process. So I'm trying to fold some of that into what I'm going to say later. Thank you very much, Julian. And please make sure you tell us a bit more later about, was it a human electric vehicles? Is that what you just said? I was going to say e-bike, but then that conjures the wrong image in your head. So okay. forget I said that. Okay, I'll forget you said that. Thanks very much, Julian. From Julian to Jacqueline. Hi, Jacqueline Hill, um, leadership coach and change mentor for people working to make the world a better place, which boils down to international development as a background. Um, and therefore, through international development, exposure to what's going on in the rest of the world regarding climate change and things like that. So, um, and a brief brush with the finance sector as a job many years ago just means I've connected all those things together and this forum is it if you know what I mean oh, we do thank you very much Jacqueline Jacqueline like Anne-Marie um is very actively supporting TTF on a number of fronts uh, Anne-Marie Jacqueline myself and four or five others today had a wonderfully constructive conversation all about outreach to undergraduates I won't bore you with why but I will say this if any of you have got any contacts with the academic world that could lead to engaging with professors, lecturers, academics, wherever they are in the world, just put the word academics into the chat and we'll make sure we'll follow up and we'll see if we can get you involved. There are already 75, 76, I think, 
academics within the TTF community. We have a new group launched a couple of weeks ago called Academics for Fairer Finance. And we've got a whole load of ideas about what we can do with that community, including the idea that we'll tell you about if the word, if, if academics is of interest to you. Rebecca Self says academics. So let's hear from Rebecca Self. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Rebecca. Um, for work, I worked in the uh, banking industry for 20 years, and I'm now an environmental consultant uh, for an organisation called South Pole. Um, I'm based in the Netherlands, not far from Harlem, actually, a place called Zandvoort, which is on the North Sea. And I'm currently looking out at a very windy and stormy sea. Wow. Um, but looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, it's lo lovely to know that you're also not a million miles away from Arthur. Uh, Alexandra, please do connect Rebecca and Arthur. I'm sure they'll find a way to grab a coffee or something at some stage as they're in the same country. It would be really nice to do that. I'm sure that they'd be happy with that. Um, super stuff. Super. We now go to Stefan. I'm a huge hero of Stefan's. Uh, he's been wonderfully supportive of TTF for several years. Um, I think of Stefan as a calming influence on my own thoughts. So you'll see why when he introduces himself. Stefan, over to you, sir. Our first non-European non, um, non of, of the evening. Thank you, Stefan. Well, not exactly non-European because my parents met in Paris. So I do have some European influence and I do consider Europe my, my second home. And I miss very much not being able to travel. Good, good day, good evening. Everyone, um, I, I uh, was having trouble reading British Summer Time and Alexandra very kindly uh, corrected me on it so that I could join today. I'm the uh, co-founder of AI for Impact, uh, which is an artificial intelligence platform focused on impact and sustainability. And I'm gonna take this opportunity to say that I was introduced to Andy through my colleague, uh, Darby Hobbs, who's working with me on AI for Impact and through Andy, I met Robert Delner on one of these symposiums and Robert, uh, Andy, you don't know this, but Robert is now using his methodology as the basis for the common impact framework on AI4. Wow, wow, wow. that's really fantastic. It is, it is a dream come true. It is literally a dream come true to have this happen. And I can't begin to tell you what's happened over the last few weeks and I won't take up any more time other than to say, that in my second role, I am the new managing partner of Equatorius Capital Group, which is wow. a venture finance firm. We're launching a pilot fund of $50 million to invest in impact innovations in Africa and India. And, um, and that's, to, that's not to say that if you were a UK based firm, but you had products or distribution centers in India and Africa that we wouldn't consider you, we would. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's a point that needs clarification there. Anyway, I'm thrilled to join this uh, group, the symposium. I always have a great time. Andy, thank you so much for your introduction and can't wait to hear from speakers. Wonderful, Stefan. Great to have you with us this evening. And I can't wait to hear more detail about your good news. I've just put a link into the chat. Please use it to fix up a call. That applies to Stefan and anybody else that wants to talk. When we have the conversation, please remind me to talk to you about um, South Africa and India um, and a chap called, oh God, what's his name? Put a blo the bloke. Hey, the bloke whose name you couldn't remember, by then I'll remember who it was, Stefan, okay? We, we now go to somebody who for the rest of the evening is gonna be called Alison's husband. So Alison's husband, please introduce yourself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello, my name's David and I'm Alison's husband. Um, <laughs> I'm an accountant and as you already know, and I would have said, but now it's already been done, live on a farm in Staffordshire, which is lovely. It's a great way of combining um, the two things that really get me up in the morning, which is numbers and the countryside. Um, and not surprisingly, of course, um, environmental and green issues are very much at the heart of what we do, yeah. um, as well as being an accountant. What I try and do with my clients, and I'll touch on this in my presentation, is promoting sustainable or sustainability reporting, particularly amongst micro and SMEs who tend to be less inclined to think about it, uh, tend to think it's the preserve of the larger organisations, who of course 
and put them into nice glossy publications alongside their annual reports and so on. Um, I'm very keen on trying to drive that down into a much broader business community um, because that's where an awful lot of business is happening. And if we can make that kind of sustainability mindset right at the heart of um, our business community, that's very much where I'm coming from. Fantastic, David. Really good to have yourself and Alison with us this evening. Fa yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. We're now going to go to Sunil, then Sharon, then Charlotte, then Alex. So Sunil, lovely to have you as always, sir. Uh, Sunil has helped us break into India. Uh, no time to explain that, uh, but it's great that we are now breaking into India. Uh, Sunil, please do introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Andy. Uh, my name is Sunil Muridhar Shastri. Uh, I'm a director of Ocean Ocean Governance Limited, uh, which is my own consultancy. Uh, I'm an independent consultant based in Hull. Uh, I have been uh, an academic researcher and a consultant all my life, and I call myself an, uh, a consultant, expert, and speaker. Uh, so that's what I do. Uh, Andy has been very kind, and I've been associated with uh, TTF uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, and Andy has kindly asked me to be uh, not just a fellow of TTF, but also an ambassador of TTF. And uh, I, am, I try my best to try to assist Andy in his very, uh, what I can only call as a very dedicated, very energetic and very, uh, you know, contagious, uh, you know, work that he does. Uh, I'm, I'm also, I'm, I'm here actually with two specific sort of interests. Uh, one is ESG, Environmental and Social Governance Investments. That's my first interest. Uh, and the second, and I, I'm learning about it. I know, don't know a lot about it, but I'm learning about it, hopefully pretty quickly. And my second one is that I am on the all-party parliamentary group on pensions. And that's, again, where somewhere uh, I wish to, I hope to contribute. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for having me. You're most welcome, sir. Um, I'll mention two things. Um, being thought of as contagious makes me feel like maybe I'm a bit like COVID. I hope I'm not. <laughs> I hope I'm not. Uh, secondly, more, more seriously, I'm very pleased and proud to tell you all that the TTF, our little started from nothing with no resource band of mavericks, has now today become the secretariat to a second all-party parliamentary group. So a few weeks ago, we became the secretariat to the pension scans all-party parliamentary group. Today, we were asked by a bunch of politicians to become the secretariat to the personal banking and fairer financial services um, all party parliamentary group as well. So somehow, bit by bit, we seem to be attracting interest, credibility, kudos, whatever you like. The important thing is this, as many of you know, our strategy for driving change is to bring together the thinking of two groups of people. On one hand, there are people like us lot who I characterize as having a sense of passion and purpose for the change that we want to see. And the other group that are also very, very important are those who have the power and the position to make change possible. These are, of course, the regulators, the politicians, the policymakers. So everything I can possibly do to get myself into the lives of politicians, I do because it's through politicians that we can make real change happen. Hence the meeting we had with Boris Johnson a few weeks ago, which is a bit of a highlight. Um, we're now going to go to Sharon. Uh, Sharon, I'm going to invite Alexandra to connect yourself and Stefan because of the South Africa connection. Sharon, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction, Andy, and for giving me the opportunity to be here with all of you today. And sorry for being a few minutes late, but I was chairing a, a board meeting and we finally got it closed. Um, I am South African born, uh, live in the UK, English family, English parents, been here for 18, 19 years now. And, but through one of my hats, I have three main hats. One is uh, corporate governance, doing board evaluations for companies. The other one being foreign exchange, where I'm an advisor to importers and exporters. The third is I am chairman of the South African Chamber of Commerce here in the UK, which gives me a lot more contact back into South Africa than I've ever had before. So for business and for the chamber, 
there's uh, regular contact into the South African community, uh, for which I've been asked to be a ambassador for TTF is for the South African side, but also I think I'm involved in the women's group and one or two others of interest. The reason this um, conversation is important to me is I work with boards all the time, uh, from PLC to financial <coughs> services to trustees to you name it. And it's just interesting to understand the variety of behavior in boardrooms around this topic from don't talk about it because I'm not interested, uh, it's not something I'm going to engage in, to saying this is the most important thing our board is talking about. And it's just getting a lot more knowledge under my belt. Uh, as Sunil said, I'm not an expert in this space at all, but I am in a position where I know how important it is to my customers and therefore want to be more knowledgeable. And Alex, at this rate, I'll be the one laughing when I see what's happening on her agenda. <laughs> yeah. and Thanks. I don't know if that answers what you wanted of me. Perfectly well, Sharon. Thank you so much. And um, as I mentioned, Alexandra will fix up a call between yourself. So she'll introduce you by email to Stefan, who's based in Boston, because I think there may be some common interest in relation to South Africa. Um, I'm going to make rather creatively a link to um, Sharon, uh, to Alex Varley Winter, because Alex, as you probably saw just now, is with her daughter, Layla. And I'm going to mention Layla in this context and only in this context. Um, we're all in our, I don't know what, our, some of you might be in your 20s, 30s, 40s, I'm in my 50s. The reality is, for us personally, where, whether we screw the planet up or not over the next few years, is probably not going to make a huge amount of difference to our lives. That's a contentious thing to say, right? A contentious thing to say, I know it is, right? But... Layla's generation is what this event is all about. And I mean that quite literally, yeah? The next generation coming behind us are in desperate need of the mums and dads and uncles and aunts and grandparents to make decisions today that <clears> won't screw <throat> the planet up for them. I've got, um, I've got a 25 year old, a 24 year old and a 14 year old and all of my children's lives are going to be impacted very positively or very negatively by the actual decisions that people make. And all the people who are in a position to make decisions on behalf of the rest of society, they all have one thing in common. They can be influenced. And I would argue they have to be influenced. I made a point at, a, at an event about the green economy we ran a few years ago, and I'm going to repeat the point I made then. You may have been in, in the past, you may have been in a building when the fire alarm went off, when you weren't sure whether it was a drill or not. And for the first few seconds, you kind of, oh, bloody hell, that's a bit inconvenient. Yeah, it's, that's, those are the thoughts that go through your mind. When will it stop? Because I want to carry on with my conversation. And then as time goes by, if the fire alarm carries on ringing, your mindset moves from this casual annoyance about the noise to, oh, my God, I wonder if there's actually something happening. And then you start thinking, kind of in the back of your mind, you start thinking, where's the exit? Are the people around me, around me looking worried or not? And all those thoughts start to happen. And I want to make the point tonight that I made a couple of years ago, which is this. If our precious planet had a fire alarm or some other alarm as a means to communicate how it was, inverted commas, feeling, that alarm would be ringing loud and so loud it would be vibrating. I've, I've, I was in a school once, I won't bore you to tears explaining why, but I was in a school once when a, a serious alarm bell went going and I've got very, very vivid memories of not only the noise of the alarm, but the actual physicality of the vibrations of the building caused by that noise. And the point I'm trying to make to you all is this. If our planet could communicate, it would be communicating noises that would sound like harsh, worried, anxious alarms going off all over the place, 
there will be more than vibrations, there will be tremors. And frankly, if our planet could talk, it would not be using words, it would be screaming in pain as a consequence of what is going on. And I say this because we really do have to somehow at a societal level, shake ourselves out of any apathy or lethargy or it can wait till tomorrow thinking. We've done all that, you know, we've wasted like 20, 30 years of knowing stuff needs to change without actually making the change happen. So yes, of course, we are just a bunch of people on a Zoom call, but we must never underestimate our own individual and collective ability to make a difference. And even if we don't believe we can make much of a difference for our generation, let's please all think of the the, the, you know, the, the, the layers of this world. Uh, Alex, over to you, please, to introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, yeah. so um, I'm a journalist. I'm running a blog for Transparency Task Force voluntarily. It's the weekly blog um, called TTF Blog. And I also write, uh, well, for the past year or so, when I do freelance work, aside from parenting, <laughs> um, I, uh, I tend to write about climate change. Um, I've done stuff for the investigative climate um, publisher D Smog, who look at kind of uh, the PR that's put around by fossil fuel companies mostly and trying to basically put a pin in that um, because companies like Exxon Mobil had scientists telling them since the 1960s what the problem was and they um, they tended to suppress it at a board level and also put out disinformation about that. So, so D Smog kind of specializes in that sort of thing. And um, the most recent piece I wrote was for a different new publication called the Sustainability Action Network. And that was about um, soil health and climate change, basically how to reduce and stop nitrous oxide emissions by um, working on the soil. So that was very interesting. I interviewed a few scientists for that. Um, and yeah, and this is Layla, who's trying to get my attention. Um, but um, yeah, but that's me. I, I do investigative journalism on a range of subjects, but I do quite a bit on climate change. Fantastic. Alex has been an absolute superstar. She's been involved with TTF for a few months and she's making a massive, massive contribution, putting a lot, a huge amount of time and effort into our work. Alex, it's a real pleasure to be working with you. Uh, and now we go to last, but certainly not least, we go to Charlotte. Charlotte, it's really, really lovely to see you with us tonight. It's been such a long time since I've seen you, spoken to you. Um, I hope you're well and please do introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, I'm sorry. I was um, not uh, on the call to start off because I, I was also picking up my children. I have a three and a half year old and a one and a half year old. Um, I had a bit of um, a kind of an epiphany this year. So I, I've been working in investments for about um, 15 years and had um, tacitly been involved with things like um, social impact investing. So I, I helped to co-author a white paper, um, but I'd always been within the investment consultants um, and fiduciary managers. And I could see that not enough was being done um, on a range of different issues, not just climate. Um, and I think if the CMA review was anything to go by, then we have a massive, massive problem, uh, not just on transparency around fees in investment management and services, but also on ESG and what's being done there. Mm -hmm. So at Pensions for Purpose, we we're a thought leader in ESG sustainability and impact investment, and we work with pension funds, consultants and managers. We provide them with training on impact investing. So actually looking to put the SDGs into action um, and implementing them in their investment belief statements, um, working with the consultants and the managers to try and put together product that um, institutional investors can access. And the most recent thing that I've been working on is um, an engagement exercise with trustees on a set of good governance principles for impact investing. Fantastic, Charlotte. Thank you so, so much. Please do, Charlotte, share into the chat any links to any of your work or any web pages, etc. That, of course, applies to absolutely everybody. Now, just before we go to Rebecca, who's our first speaker this evening, I want to spend a few minutes telling you about Violation Tracker. Now, I know some of you know about Violation Tracker. Um, I want you all to know about Violation Tracker and I want you all to know that the Transparency Task Force is investing a lot of time and effort in bringing Violation Tracker to the UK. Now, 
very often when I talk about violation tracker, I talk about violations in relation to banking fraud and all that kind of stuff. It's very, very important, but that's not the reason I'm showing it to you this evening. The reason I'm showing it to you this evening is because Violation Tracker is a wonderfully powerful resource that everybody in the climate space, the ESG space, the governance space, in the sustainable investment space needs to be aware of. I'll do this very succinctly, but I'll put a link into the chat. If you want to be involved with the Violation Tracker project that we've got on the go, there's about 15, 20 of us from around the world. Um, then just put the words violation tracker in and I'll make sure I follow up with you. The bit I want to show you is this. Violation tracker tracks violations, you know, infringements, rule breaking, etc. You can search the database in many, many ways. The bit I want to show you is this bit here. So if you go to um, offence groups and if you scroll down, you'll see environment related offences. OK, environment related offences. This will be of interest. To, for example, take Charlotte, any pension fund or any bunch of pension professionals that have an interest in ESG, environmental issues, etc., will want to know about this database, especially when we bring it to the UK. You click on that. You get the top 10 worst offending organisations. BP's at the top. Twenty seven billion dollars worth of fines. 158 incidences. Remember, this isn't 158 offences. These are the ones they got caught. Yeah. $27 billion worth of fines. The next is VW. I guess that's a lot of Dieselgate stuff, etc, 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 etc. And what you can do, and it's really quite powerful, you can then scroll down further and you get the individual offences. So BP in 2015, the agency that prosecuted them was the Department of Justice, an environmental violation, $20 billion worth. And if you then click on this particular um, matter, you go straight into the individual record of that particular case. It's all here for you. It's all literally waiting for you to go and access it. You can then click on this bit, for example, here, where you will normally, sometimes the links are broken, this one's live, it will give you the actual originating source of the information. So what we're saying to Violation Tracker, we've got this big project on the go, is Violation Tracker is brilliant. We want it all over the world. We've got a global network. Let's bring Violation Tracker to the UK. And having done that, let's get it into Canada. Let's get it into, into Australia, into mainland Europe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So please be aware, Violation Tracker is a wonderful, free to use resource that many of you will find extremely useful. So that's Violation Tracker. Put the words Violation Tracker in the chat if you want to know more about that. We're now going to go to Rebecca, who I'm going to invite to unmute herself and, and to spend 10 minutes or so sharing her insights. I encourage you to make sure you're on speak of you. You will know you're on speak of you if what you've got in front of you right now is me occupying most of your screen and everyone else in little, little thumb sketches around it. Rebecca, thank you for being with us this, this evening. Over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Great, thank you and hello again everyone. Um, so I have some slides, but first a very short introduction to me. Um, so as I said earlier, I spent 20 years working in banking since I graduated in London, in Zurich and in the US. And about 10 years into that, just after the global financial crisis, had this moment of realization of what the heck am I doing? What is this industry doing? And it's not quite what I thought it was. Um, from that moment, I started to pivot my career, working on uh, banking reform and regulations within the bank, and then also moved into ESG full time um, about seven or eight years ago. And at that point, um, I was still in the organisation. Um, my last role was CFO of sustainable finance, um, where I had a balance sheet and so on. Uh, but at that point, a number of people said to me seven or eight years ago, this is a career limiting move. You're moving into a very fluffy topic. You're going away from the mainstream. Um, this is a big mistake. Um, and I found that very interesting at the time. It didn't deter me, but it was very interesting to have that reaction and very interesting now to see those same people um, coming back and asking questions and being really interested in the topic. Um, so today, I'll go through a bit of the context and the why, won't spend too long, talk a bit about what sustainable finance is and what it's not, 
and then finally some of the policy levers. So getting started, I'll try and share my screen. Hopefully this works. There we go. Okay. Um, so I won't go into a huge amount of detail on the Paris Agreement, um, but this is the agreement from 2015, approximately 200 countries signed to keep emissions, carbon emissions, within a certain level that leads to a maximum of a 1.5 or 2 degree warming by 2100. Right now, we're pretty far off that based on individual commitments by countries. And some climate scientists, I studied for a master's at the University of Cambridge uh, with a focus on climate disclosures. Some of the climate scientists I spoke to there were thinking that we were actually on for above four, maybe even five or six degrees warming by 2100. But that won't be spread evenly. Some places will be even warmer, some places even cooler. And if I take the UK, for instance, the holding capacity of the air, the water holding capacity of the air, is projected to increase by 7%. And that means more floods, but again, not equal. In London, it's very likely to have longer periods of dry and then very intense rainfall. Um, but because of increasing urbanisation, lack of green spaces, the water has nowhere to go. So an increase in surface water flooding. Whereas in the north of the UK, it's likely to be more consistent um, and more river and coastal flooding. And of course, there's lots of other examples. Um, and just a reminder, back from 2007, there were 50,000 properties impacted by the big floods in the UK. And that's likely to increase over time. That's just one country. And mentioned the sustainable development goals earlier, 17 goals to be completed by 2030 for businesses, individuals, the private sector, governments to meet. Um, there's a program called the Good Life Goals. You can Google it for individuals. And I try and work through some of those um, myself. But just to dig into number 12, responsible production and consumption. So typically the economy and the way that we work is very linear. We dig stuff out the ground, do stuff to it, and then put it back into the ground. Um, and this is all about trying to close that loop, to move to something more circular, um, which is reducing waste, recycling, but also using and consuming less. So stopping the problem at source. And if we look at the earth, the amount it regenerates um, resources each year, so food, water, um, other, other resources, and average that by the number of people on the planet. Typically in Northern Europe, dependent on lifestyle, we consume four times the annual um, regenerative capacity of the earth. If you look at the US and North America, that's around 10 times the annual um, average capacity. And if you have steady state economics, so GDP growth going up in a line like this, uh, that simply tells you we're going to run out of stuff pretty soon. Um, soils is one example that's been mentioned already. Um, so there's some research that says we have 70 good harvests left. So it could even be sooner that some of these resources start running out. And then just to mention donut economics here. So this is Kate Rayworth, the University of Oxford. Um, so another way of looking at the economic system that has the ecological constraints around the outer ring and then social constraints on the inner ring. So living within that green donut. And you can see here on the red, we're really outside of our resource constraints, our ecological constraints in quite a number of different areas. So what does that, this have to do with sustainable finance? Well, we've mentioned ESG earlier. So that's um, sustainable finance put simply is defined as integrating ESG into investment and lending decisions. Um, there's a Nicola, a Nicola Stern report, a Nicola Stern report that says this will also have economic benefits, GDP benefits if we start to do this, but it's not happening now fully. Why? Well, part of this is about short termism. 
again mentioned already, a relentless focus on the next quarter or the next year. Most sell-side analysts' models go to a maximum of three years, perhaps even 18 months. Um, again, when I moved uh, to ESG, a number of the sell-side analysts said, um, well, we'll never speak to you again. This isn't for us. It's not something we take into account in our valuations. Um, and again, what's interesting is in one or two of them, I've started speaking to again um, quite recently. And again, just to talk about the spectrum of capital and this, this long-term issue. Um, so right now on the left-hand side, this is traditional investments. So no ESG criteria can invest in anything. Probably circa 60% of investments are in that bucket. You then have responsible investments where some degree of ESG has been taken into account. Typically no cluster munitions. Um, it could also be no coal, um, but increasingly you have the so-called SIN stocks, which are excluded also. So that's alcohol, tobacco, gaming, adult entertainment, but that's still not positive. It's just do no harm. As you move across to this impact driven, you really get to the crux of the issue. These are typically companies or projects which are very small in scale. They're more um, locally focused um, and they're really hard to finance. There's more risk associated with them. Um, when I was in, in the bank and a CFO, um, I was looking for these projects, but typically they had a much higher risk weighting when I was looking to invest. And then the markets. So this green line here is green bonds. Um, so a big dramatic increase. Um, but to put that into context, the fixed income market is around 100 trillion US dollars that's issued each year by banks and by corporations. And green bonds is 2%. So for all the talk, it's very small. And the lending, green lending is below. That's less than 1% when you put it into the context of overall lending and financing in the economy. So what are some of the levers? What can we do about this? Well, there are market drivers. Um, I won't touch all of them, but COVID actually is one. Um, so during the pandemic, those uh, responsible stocks, which had an ESG do no harm, performed better. Um, so typically the MSCI ESG index was down um, around 12%. But meanwhile, the S&P index, the general index was down around 24%. Um, so that was an economic driver. And there's other uh, policy and investor drivers here. The UN and the EU are also really active in this issue. Um, principles of responsible banking and also investment. So bringing in some of those ESG criteria. And then there's a number of other initiatives um, which increasingly are being used post COVID. Just to mention TCFD, so this is climate related financial disclosures. And in Canada, um, they've actually integrated this into bailout loans. So if you want a COVID bailout loan, you have to complete and file TCFD. Um, now I'll mention net zero briefly here. Um, so it's again, big buzzword at the moment. When I think about net zero, I think about a bathtub and keeping carbon emissions at a constant level. There's two ways to do that, to keep that net zero. Either you turn down the tap, you avoid the carbon in the first place, or you pull out the plug and you have offsets, i.e. trees. And in reality, it's probably a combination of both those things that we want, but clearly want to uh, prefer to have avoidance. And this is the final slide. So when I think about verifying these claims, lots of big, bold claims and ambitions at the moment, what I look for from the financial sector is these three things. Have they told me where they need to improve? No one is perfect. So if it's all the good news stories, not very credible. Number two, what have you changed? You know, tell me what you've changed as a result of ESG. And then number three, is this really backed by science? And how has that claim been verified by science with estimates and assumptions and so on? And there's a number of um, other nonprofits that present research. And I would just uh, encourage you, while I was working at the bank, I was often told, um, Customers aren't interested in this topic. There's no demand. People don't care. Um, and again, we can all do something. We can go and talk to our banks, talk to our pension schemes, ask what they're doing on climate change um, and prompt that demand. Even a simple question, it really helps. 
and I'll leave it there. Thanks. Uh, wonderful. I can't quite believe how much you managed to pack into that, Rebecca. <laughs> that was like 10 minutes bang on, I think, and that was fantastic. Really, really great. Um, really great. Let's open up for questions and comments. We've got about five minutes for that, so please uh, don't hold back, folks. So share your thoughts. Just raise your hand if you would like to say something. Uh, Stefan is, is first off the mark. Stefan, please do unmute and uh, share what you'd like to share. Thank you. Uh, so Rebecca, wonderful presentation. I wonder if you know the work that's being done at Harvard Business School on impact weighted accounts. Um, Sir Ronald Cohen of, of the Global Steering Committee on Impact Investing. I know some of it. I must confess, there are so many different initiatives. I um, kind of lose track. Um, but yeah, I do follow the work of Harvard and there's some really fantastic work there. Um, but even They're this is a big issue. There's just too many initiatives to follow. No, I know. Um, they are moving into phase two where they're actually producing some numbers uh, based on environmental performance of certain companies. They have three categories, environmental performance, uh, employee diversity, inclusion, and product. And by product, I mean, does the product do good for the, you know, for the society and for the environment, or is making the product harmful? So the product may actually have a good utility, but making it causes more harm than, you know, it's worth. And um, so I don't, I, we're looking at working with them uh, primarily for the financial calculus on impact, you know, for where we get our data, how we do the stress testing. And then we're looking to them to finally put the, the financial calculus on it. And I was just wondering if, if you had looked at that and if any of, of their work had factored into what you were doing with sustainable finance. Yeah, not in any detail, but I'd love to have a conversation about it. Okay, <laughs> be fantastic. I'll, I'll link in with you. Yeah, sounds good. Very, very good. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much. Uh, would anybody else like to uh, take some time to share a comment or a question? I've got one. Um, I've got one. Rebecca, if you wouldn't mind responding to this. Um, I keep hearing of developments around green energy that the oil companies buy up to stop them getting into the market. Is, is that kind of behavior, is it fiction? Is it a myth? Does anybody know if that kind of thing really is going on? Do the, does the old GARG, you know, the old carbon-based energy companies, do they actually do stuff to, from, from their point of view, protect their market share, whilst, of course, in the process, knacker our planet? Does anybody have any comments of that about that? Sunil, please do share your thoughts, Sunil. Thank you. Yes, I mean, this is, this is uh, sort of patently obvious, and it has it is being the practice of large multinational oil corporations, the sette sotore, as they were called by, uh, by the Italian uh, oil minister a long time ago, seven sisters. Now, they I don't know how many sisters, there are four or five, I think. Uh, but um, I think all you have to do is see this movie by uh, the guy who, who made, um, what, what's, what, what's he called, the guy who made the movie about, uh, where's my country, you know? Michael Moore, Michael. Was the American Michael Moore. So yeah. there's a there's a recent movie actually, quite recent movie, which is of course heavily heavily criticized because um, he has uh, not done his research properly about stuff. But if you if you just look at the movie, it gives you an idea of how uh, big businesses, I mean, I mean, including very famous environmentalists, so-called environmentalists, uh, they they have got into this league of uh, being in bed with large oil corporations in, in order that they can thwart or subvert uh, the green energy situation. Otherwise, I mean, okay, let, let me just give you a very quick example before I finish. When I was an undergraduate student in engineering, we were reading and studying about wave energy and tidal energy and wind energy and offshore wind energy and solar energy, all those kind of things, right? Completely renewable energy. I'm not even talking about biomass energy. No carbon, I mean, no carbon emission, as it were, apart from, of course, in installation. But that was in 1970s. So that's like 40 years ago, yeah, betraying my age. 
but but even now we are still talking about the same stuff we we not gone on much more you know i i have a quick one about it we call it hum, human beings uh things are not any good for us unless we can kill cut dig or burn them okay <laughs> and wow. and we are no different than animals here kill dig cut is what animals do the only thing we are superior is burn and that's all we've been doing kill dig cut burn of course we become better and better we become more efficient we become more sophisticated but we haven't moved on you know so thanks that's my point thank you very much indeed i am um, i i wasn't aware of the film you referred to i quickly googled while you were chatting is it called planet of the humans does that no no no, no? what's it called what's the movie called just one sec I'll, i'll tell you in a second yeah thank you if you whack it into the chat sonil that would be that would be good once you yeah. find it uh yeah. fantastic thank you very much indeed uh what we're mm-hmm. going to do now folks to keep more or less the time is we're going to wave like six year olds and the reason we wave like six year olds is because on zoom we can't really applaud properly but we can wave to show our appreciation to rebecca for her talk and it's therefore time to behave like a six year old just reconnect with the inner child so thank you very much indeed rebecca we're all applauding you thank you very very much indeed thank you and we're now going to go to yeah. we're now going to go to our husband second it is a planet of the demon planet so okay okay yeah. thank you very much indeed we're now going to go to alison's husband so please do unmute yourself and go for it sir thanks david thank you very much thank you very much indeed yes um i'm no yes thank you alison for laughing yes for my my new nickname is alison's husband um what i'll do i've also got some powerpoint slides i'll just pop them up and um we'll launch straight into it and um yeah there's bound to be questions at the end so please do uh, do throw them at me at the end so can you have my slides come up on your screen excellent thank you andy that's brilliant right accelerating our journey well we've already been um oh why is this not moving I'm having fun here. Let me go here. That's why it's not moving. Thank you. Yeah. It's already been mentioned about the Paris Agreement um setting a target to limit the indus- uh, limit the average global temperature increase to below 2 degrees below pre-industrial levels with the aim of keeping it below 1 and a half by 2100. Well, Andy mentioned right at the start that uh, if the world could uh, could shout it would be screaming In July this year the World Meteorological Organization assessed that there was a 20% chance that we would break that by 2024 within the next 4 years never mind the next 78 or 70 how many years left 20% chance of that being exceeded in the next 4 years so this truly is a absolutely vital part of what we need to be thinking about and of course what makes it worse is that 60% of those global greenhouse emissions come from just six countries now this presents a huge challenge to the global business and investment community because if you think of the number of countries that are looking to develop and build their economies and you look particularly at the um the southern um hemisphere nations and so on and the contribution that they want to make and the impact on their communities as they've got to develop think of the greenhouse emissions that are going to come out of that there is clearly a need for everyone to rethink how we build our economy and develop our economies and as a financial services group with the TGF i put a put a financial services hat on thought well okay where can we take a lead as financial services people And of course as we all know the financial service market globally I mean I've got a figure on there of however many 26.5 trillion you can come up with a whole raft of numbers depending on how big or small you want to what you want to count but effectively about 25% of global gdp comes out of financial services and therefore it's absolutely central to any effort to reshape our economy the environment social and environment policies and from that my 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 approach in that very much is to say that the pension funds are perhaps the most obvious place to start 
because as, as um, was quite rightly pointed out uh, by Rebecca, most of the financial services sector, most of the companies that we work for take a very short term view. The next quarter, the next six months, the next year. And this needs a long term focus to cover most of the issues and holding the companies to account from shareholder action. And we're starting to see much more effort now from particularly the pension funds to start to hold um, the companies that they invest into account. But quite often it's still noise and bluster in many ways. And this potentially needs to be strengthened and we need to empower and encourage our pension funds and the trustees to really shout much more strongly about this. Because we do need a green, new green global economy to respond to the challenges of climate change. And imagination and innovation will be needed because we know that business as usual is no longer a realistic option. The coordinated financial stimulus needed to rebuild the world economy can either lock us into that vulnerable fossil fuel based system or accelerate investment into a low carbon transition, creating jobs, technological innovation, market stimulus, using public funds to trigger much more private finance. But that needs uh, an unprecedented multi-stakeholder collaboration to link those climate and economic agendas so that we can deliver the desire, the shared desire for climate security, energy, food, water security, economic security and equity through enhanced capital and technology flows, all through the creation of a package that promotes economic growth by decarbonizing the world's economy. The Global Commission on the Economy and Climate has shown that a new climate economy based on renewable energy sources would create better growth with more employment and higher GDP than business as usual with a fossil fuel based economy, whilst also protecting us from climate change. There's no economic reason not to make a rapid transition. However, most present efforts to address the economic crisis have emphasized relaunching consumption, maintaining certain sectors such as the automobile industry in the hope of returning to a consumption based economy with only marginal efforts to invest in greener alternatives. And of course, the reason for that is that there are too many vested interests wanting to protect the status quo. And there is a danger which a number of, of thinkers and, and writers have, have mentioned on uh, when researching and, and looking at the green economy is that any move to something called a green economy would just be consumption with a new name. And the debate on how to do this it's really still in many ways still on the fringes. And again, following on from um, what Rebecca said earlier on, many of these proposals are still within the economists growth paradigm, which is, as Rebecca mentioned, unsustainable. Growth cannot continue forever in a finite system. Our consumer society is overdeveloped and the costs of unsustainability are rising. So much so that, that some people are now starting to talk about degrowth in the wealthy economies. Putting out the large fire that we're in requires that coordinated response by a lot of actors. And that means the effective governance at the same scale becomes the problem. The economy has globalized, but economic management mechanisms are still largely national. The system of governance based on national sovereignty has a lot of difficulty in addressing global problems effectively, as illustrated by the slow pace of intergovernmental action on climate change, and of course, by some countries withdrawing from agreements or perhaps not moving as fast as, as, as their words would indicate. And at the same time, the diversity of situations around the world requires a, a nested set of levels of governance to keep decision-making close to the level of action to encourage innovation and local adaptation. And so we need to evolve uh, effective institutions of governance at all of the scales of the problems as we face global change. And there's often a, a prejudice against some of that um, global approach, largely because of the ideological or political positions 
that governments are essentially inefficient or bureaucratic, and the less we have of them, better. And yet, essential government, effective government, is an essential component of any civilized society. And any business community recognizes this because, of course, stability is very much at the heart of what many of us ask for in developing business um, proposals. Europe. Uh, as a community has pioneered the creation of those institutions at a regional scale, however imperfect. And, you know, it gives us a good idea of some of the things that can potentially be done as we move forward. Um, again, some of these things I'm talking about, Rebecca very kindly picked up earlier, earlier on, donut economics being a really useful tool to, to visualise this, um, developed by Oxford economist Kate Rayworth. Our 21st century challenge is to meet the needs of everyone within the means of the planet. In other words, to make sure that no one falls short in life essentials, whilst ensuring that collectively we don't overshoot our pressure on Earth's life supporting systems on which we fundamentally depend. Stable climate, fertile soils, protective ozone layer. And her framework, um, uh, as the diagram that we saw earlier briefly put together, brings together the social foundations inspired by the aims of the Sustainable Development Goals, food security, health, education, income and work. And noting, of course, that work is not limited just to employment, but also includes such things as homemaking, peace, justice, political voice, social and gender equality and equity, housing, networks, energy and water. Combining that with the nine ecological ceilings from the planetary boundaries put forward by a range of Earth scientists, looking at climate change, ocean acidification, chemical pollution, nitrogen and phosphorus loading, freshwater withdrawals, land conversion, creation of carbon sinks, the conversion of land for economic activity, uh, which can damage or remove habitat and so on biodiversity loss, air pollution, and ozone depletion. And this is particularly important because it's very clear that the export-led consumer demand-based growth model that fueled, for instance, the Northeast Asian economic transformation is unsustainable for the rest of the world. And yet we absolutely cannot condone a system that would keep the best parts of 60% of the world's people in permanent poverty to build them up whilst preventing our own self-destruction requires and demands that we take the lead in creating that new economic mindset that brings people, planet and profit together. And so, yes, this wonderful diagram comes up on my presentation as well. Thank you very much, Rebecca, um, for, for, for forwarding this, but it perhaps reinforces just what an important and foundational bit of work this 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 diagram this concept from uh, from 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 um rachel at, uh, at oxford says the problem is we are failing on virtually every single measure and here the challenge to the long-term financial sector by which clearly pensions are going to be right at the heart of it is to take the long-term effects of government policy seriously and to lead the way in making the changes necessary. Politicians are by their very nature short-term animals. Stock markets are by their very nature short-term animals. Those financial se service sectors with genuine long-term perspective, pension funds specifically, are uniquely placed to lead the challenges needed. But to what extent are they taking sustainability reporting as seriously as financial reporting? And as a hint, my answer would be is they're not. We all know that the current turmoil in financial reporting caused by poor auditing by the big four accountancy firms. As an accountant, I am almost ashamed to say that I place absolutely no faith in statutorily audited accounts. The failings that have been known about for many years and have quite simply been ignored by the profession and the regulators and fortunately, for, uh, they are not as yet major players in setting and maintaining standards in environmental performance and reporting. If they were, I would start to worry. 
there are clear standards in place with a number of very useful frameworks for uh, structuring those standards. Personally, I happen to favor the GRI framework, Global Reporting Initiative framework. That's the one I tend to use in, in working with clients uh, in putting together their sustainability reports, although there are others and they're equally very good and helpful. Um, but what they do is they create that common language for organizations, large and small, public and private, to report on their sustainability impact in a, in a consistent and credible way, which then enhances global uh, comparability and enables us to be transparent and, as, as uh, Rebecca quite clearly pointed out, uh, making them accountable for what people are saying. So if you're not, my, certainly my call, I suppose, at the end of the day, is if you or the organisations you're working with are not making sustainability reporting a central part of your long-term focus for investments and planning, then I'd certainly urge you to consider it. Um, and that's essentially the fundamental point of where I'm at. So thank you very much. Any questions? David, thank you very much indeed. I think you've helped to add a lot of the new points to what Rebecca was talking about, but you've also reinforced some of the very powerful points that Rebecca was also making. Uh, wonderful input. Thank you very much indeed, David. Thank you. We'll go to a gallery view so we can. I can see you all. Uh, would anybody like to make a comment in relation to anything that David has said or indeed anything else or indeed anything else so far? Mr. Johnny Storm of Darling, go for it, please. Thank you. Hi, David. Thanks. That's really interesting. Um, uh, filling in a few gaps in my knowledge there. And I'm just wondering, I've read quite a lot about degrowth um, in the last year. And I'm just wondering if you think there's any way where the sort of the, the way that pensions are done as, as your sort of example, I mean, could pensions be rejigged to fit with the degrowth agenda by replacing some of that financial investment with you know, government uh, arranged uh, social innovation. Yeah, I mean, stuff like that. Degrowth as a as a as a as a name has, like many issues, got its strengths and it, its weaknesses. I happen to think it's personally um, can be a very useful model. I mean, certainly we in in moving to the farm. I'm, um, have tried very hard to, to build that into the way we live our lives and to increase the sustainability of what we do. Um, Realising that for politically, for a lot of people, it's going to be quite hard to do um, because it does require sacrifices and changes and, and so on to what you're doing. But equally, we all know we've all got to make fairly major changes to our lifestyle as Western people anyway. Um, at the end of the day, it it it's yeah. I don't know whether I have an answer to be brutally honest. Um, like many people in this sector, it's lots of questions. It's about talking to each other and getting policy frameworks in place to help make things happen. Um, there's an awful lot more we could be doing just to make what we do now yeah. much more sustainable. Um, without getting people to think about about, about degrowth. I do think it could be made a lot easier for people to move to a more, uh, to a less global economy, shall we say. And, and I tend to think more in terms of localization rather than necessarily degrowth um, as a way of living. I think the, the, the policy and business frameworks that we live in are very much set up to encourage long distance trade, long distance um, and global business supply chains. And I think certainly there could be much more done to localize and support and develop local delivery systems. Um, that would have a whole range of benefits, not only in terms of climate change, because it reduces things like food miles, travel miles and so on, but also it would have a massive impact on things like local business communities, the high street, um, and the creation of uh, more of a sense of community. I mean, one of the things that was very clear in the town where we used to live was that there was very much a dormitory mentality, even within estates within the town, didn't talk to each other. And that creates um, 
very much a, 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 an insular set of communities that that start to fear each other. Because again, where you start to, to separate yourself from the people around you, you generate fear, that creates all sorts of prejudice and problems, which in many ways I think has <laughs> contributed to some of the problems we've had in the UK with um, the Brexit debate and so on. So that's a roundabout way of saying there's a whole raft of answers there. Yeah, you. your, um, your answer there is exactly the same answer that would be given by the, the research staff at the Institute for Global Prosperity at UCL, where I am now. Um, pretty much, they're very much focused on this like localized uh, definitions of prosperity. Uh, we know sort of two communities of 2,000 people sized, and hopefully that can sort of spread in a kind of global, local way. Yeah. Um, just to follow up very briefly, um, when you're doing the environmental accounting with your uh, GRI, do you use, do you represent everything in pounds or do you, because that, I think it's something. No, because sometimes things about. can't be done in monetary terms. Sometimes yeah. you've got to put, um, you've got to do the narrative form because <laughs> it's not just about money. Yeah. Is there a good resource? I mean, if I just search for that, will there be? Will if you I... just search for GRI, Global Resource Initiative, they, their website is full of really good stuff. Sure. Um, and in fact, there's templates and all sorts of stuff on there, really, really good. And there are a couple of others as well, I can't remember. But if you look up sustainability reporting standards, there's some really good stuff on there. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, David. Um, anybody else before we move to the next stage in our session? Charlotte, please do... Uh, Make your point. Thank you. Yeah, no, I just wanted to kind of follow up on the point about pension funds, because I think it is an important one. And there's been a lot of um, campaigns. So Make My Money Matter, for example, which is targeting members. Yeah. Um, the Impact Investing Institute is sort of targeting policy making, pensions for purpose, or looking at trustees, consultants, managers. And I think a lot of this is about working in collaboration with um, all of the different groups to actually affect the whole yeah. chain of stakeholders. Often, too much onus is lumped on the trustees and the reality is is that they don't have the expertise and they do often rely on consultants and the consultants have been very very far behind on this and they only set up a sustainability working group this year wow. um, they've had about two meetings um, and they've finally decided that ESG is not a tick box exercise which is brilliant um, but um, you know I think you know we're working very very hard to get um, TPR and also the DWP to get behind the impact investing principles and we as a group also work with uh, pension fund authorities to actually put in their investment belief statements that they want to sign up to particular sustainable development goals in order to reach um, net zero carbon emissions so it isn't just a lofty target without any idea of how they're going to get there I think there has to be a step-by-step -step approach um, and we make them think about the investment thesis and then they push the investment consultant to go and find them the product they need. And I think that that needs to happen to drive um, investment in, in the right area. Thank you very much indeed, Charlotte. Thank you. OK, we're going to move to the next part of our uh, event. Uh, before we do that, of course, we're going to say thank you to David by waving like six year olds. So let's let's do it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. OK. Um, we're going to spend um, a couple of minutes talking about an idea and then we're going to have a five minutes or so comfort break. But just to give you a heads up, I need I need three people to volunteer to do something that will probably take up three minutes of your five minute comfort break. So if you're inclined to volunteer to help me on something, then please, please use some of your comfort break for doing this task that I think will probably take about three minutes, maybe less. OK, I'll explain the task I've just put into the chat a link to uh, this web page. So what you're looking at here is the web page of all the all party parliamentary groups. OK, now there's a whole load of them are about countries, so we're not focusing on those. What we are going to do is three volunteers are going to kindly volunteer to go through the subject groups. The first volunteer is going to have the subject groups beginning with the letters A through to G. That's alpha to golf. And what you're going to do is just find any all party parliamentary groups that might be relevant. The most obvious one is the one on climate change. So what we want to do is identify the one on climate change. We'll then put a plan in place to actually reach out to the people that run it. And that's easy because um, the people that run it, what we want is a public inquiry point. 
In this case, it's come somebody called Jacob. We've got the email address, we've got a phone number, etc. We'll reach out and we'll try to engage and find out what they're up to, etc., etc., etc. I'll go back to the rest of the list. So we want somebody to volunteer to cover uh, A to G. We want somebody to volunteer to cover letters H to P, that's hotel to uh, Papa, and somebody to cover Q for Queen through to Z for Zoo. Um, so we're going to have a five minute comfort break now. Could you please, if you don't mind, raise your hands to volunteer to take one of those. We've got David's volunteered, Sunil and Julian. So David, can you please take A to G, so Alpha to Golf? Um, Sunil, can you please take Hotel to Papa? And Julian, can you please take uh, Queen to Z? And when we reconvene, just report back which ones look like they might be relevant. That's all you need to do, okay? It's uh, 16 minutes past the hour. We're going to reconvene at 23 minutes past the hour, please. I'm saying past the hour because some of you are outside the UK. So 23 minutes past. Um, thank you very much indeed for those folks who've just volunteered to do that little exercise. We'll do something useful with it, I promise you. So you've got complete freedom to do what you like, unless you've just volunteered until three, 23 minutes past the hour. Thank you very much indeed. So far, so good. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK. OK, I think it's um, time to reconvene. So let's all come out of what we call stealth mode in TTF land. When we are working as a group, sometimes we're working live on Zoom and sometimes we're in what we call stealth mode, which is when we mute and we obscure our video. So who were the three volunteers? I know we had Sunil, we had Julian and we had uh, Alison's wife, uh, sorry, Alison's husband. <laughs> I made it even worse then. So, who had Alpha de Golf? David, you're on, you're, you're on mute. That's quite all right. I was just saying, are you judging me? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, who had Alpha de Golf, A to G? That was me. I did Alpha de Golf. Right, right. Okay, so there was the one on climate change. Were there, <laughs> any, were there any others? Uh, yes, <laughs> depending on how deep you wanted to go, yeah. there's the group on agroecology for sustainable food and farming. That's relevant, definitely, yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, there's a group on air pollution. Yeah. There is um, a group on, I think they say there's climate change, there was a group on conservation people and uh, places and people, corporate governance, corporate responsibility. Yes. There's a group on electric aviation and a group on electric vehicles, which might be interesting. Yep. There's a group specifically on ethics and sustainability in fashion. In what, sorry, what was that last word? Wow, okay, that's interesting, yeah. Um, there's a group on energy security. Um, there's a group on flood prevention, which may be of interest. Yep. A group on forestry and tree planting. There's a group on the fourth industrial revolution. Okay, wow. Okay, this is good. Yeah. Um, and then the, there's a group of, <coughs> uh, say the group on fracking is probably more industry led yeah. um, than green led, but never mind. Um, and then there's a whole raft of other stuff that, that's cut sort of of a side interest or maybe vaguely because there's, there's like there's a group on air pollution, um, on animal welfare, and things like that. But I kind of yeah, yeah, no. The ones I've mentioned so far is because of the key ones that were very clearly environment kind of related. Brilliant job, David. Absolutely brilliant job. Thank you very much. Could I trouble you, please, sir, if you don't mind, to yep. whack the names of those into the group chat? We'll do indeed. Thanks. And then what we'll do next week or maybe the week after, because we're a bit busy at the moment, next week, me, you... Julian and Sunil will have a conversation about next steps. Yeah. If anybody else wants to be involved in this parliamentary outreach, just put the words parliamentary outreach, yes, please, into the chat, and I'll make sure that we invite you to be part of that group as well. Uh, what we're basically going to do is figure out whether another APPG is needed. If it is, we'll create one. We know how to do that now. If there isn't, then we'll make sure the ones that already exist are doing what they could and should be doing when it comes to influencing the way the investment world works, particularly the pensions world. I hope that's all crystal clear. If it's not, then just get in touch. Uh, we're now going to go to, uh, who had uh, H to P, Hotel to Papa? Was that Sunil? Sunil, please, were there any in your part of the alphabet, sir? Right, okay. So uh, straight away, there is health, which is an important issue. Right, yeah. Because 
just health and then health care, but also mental health as a result of losing pensions and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, human rights. Yeah. Uh, Heathrow expansion, regional connectivity, etc., because those are huge projects, and there's going to be public-private partnerships and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, inheritance and intergovernmental, intergenerational fairness. Okay. Yeah, got that. Uh, insurance and financial services. Definitely. Then there is local authority pension funds. Yeah. Uh, Loan charges. Yes. Uh, there is things on uh, pension scams. Yeah, that's our one that we created. We know that one very well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's, of course, uh, payments, open banking. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and then that's... no recourse to public funds. That's another one. Right. Post Brexit funding. Okay. Okay, there and are private, and private renting. Okay, there are several there that I'm sure may well be relevant. Sunil, thank you very, very much for doing that for us. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind, pick out the ones that you think are most relevant to the whole environment related space. There may be some, there may be none, it's your shout, but put, put them into the into the chat, please. And then we'll organize that Zoom call, involve you and go from there. Thank you very much indeed, Sunil, for volunteering. Yeah, it be environment related or, or financial services related? In, environment or related, environment related. Yeah, environment related. Okay, okay. thank you very much. So, thank you. Okay. And last but by no means least, we're going to, going to go to Julian Todd. Firstly, to hear if he's got any in his part of the list, which is a uh, queen to uh, to zebra. Um, and then Julian's our next speaker. So Julian, please do share with us any thoughts that you have. I think Julian has just disappeared, which tells me he's probably hit the wrong button. Instead of um, unmuting himself, he's probably exited the whole session. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to go to Arthur because Arthur put a question to me before we uh, went to the break uh, to uh, ask about whether we were interested in the UK. Uh, Arthur, please expand on the reasoning behind your, your question. Thank you. Yes, hello, thanks. Um, yeah, I was just uh, wondering because um, uh, I thought this was a global task force, but then I already saw that many of you are UK based and advocacy is, is my, is 80% of what I do. So um, I think it's very important and that was the reason for my question. Thank you very much indeed. We are very, very UK centric, but becoming increasingly less so as our tentacles get into other parts of the world. Um, I think we are, uh, we still don't have Jules, so I've got a hunch she's either got an internet problem or, or something's grabbing his attention. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch the order of speakers and we're going to invite Arthur to demonstrate how, how nimble and agile he is by immediately becoming the next speaker when he wasn't expecting it. So Arthur, right. over to <laughs> you. Will, will you be okay. able to cope with a challenge? Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Andy, for inviting me and everybody for keeping pushing me to, to participate in this group. I find it very interesting. I feel also very much at home. Um, so I would like to explain briefly um, what I am doing and what is the background, what uh, also what Ecopreneur wants to achieve, because 80%, like I said, what I do is um, working for Ecopreneur, which is the European Federation of Sustainable Business. And Ecopreneur has six members, so it's a European federation, federation with star six members, each one representing um, SMEs mostly in their member states. So we have Germany, France and Austria, which founded Ecopreneur back in 2016, but we also have the Netherlands, Belgium and Sweden as new members. I myself come from the Netherlands, I live in the Netherlands, but I'm since last year the director of Ecopreneur, which is based in Belgium. So before COVID, I was one or two days a week in Belgium. Now I'm doing things remote like everybody. Um, and these SMEs, that is very special. They are all committed to sustainable sustainability, to deliver sustainable products and services. And the objective of Ecopreneur is to do advocacy and projects to create a sustainable economy. 
also specialists that um, five companies from the 3000 form the advocacy group of Ecopreneur. And these are Tarket, Interface, uh, Raymondis, all large companies because they can afford to spend time on it. But also Venom Udmets, which is smaller, and also one really SME, um, which is from the Humana group. Um, now, also, we are uh, members of various platforms in. Uh, Brussels, so we are already seen as the political voice for sustainable business in Europe, especially for SMEs. And uh, as an example, I was also a member last year of, of the, yeah, that was last year of the taxonomy, I think it was called like the taxonomy expert group, which was advising on the taxonomy for sustainable finance. Um, but I'm also a member of the European Circular Economy stakeholder platform. Now, um, what are we working on? What am I working on? Um, first of all, I'm, I'm responding to what you earlier said, Andy. I, I think that with COVID, climate change and, 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 and the fact that we live on a, on a finite planet is already changing our lives. For me, I've been waiting for this to happen uh, since 2006 when I moved from lobbying for industry, which I did before, to uh, trying to work on sustainability. Um, I've been waiting for what, when will we experience it? Well, for me, this is, this is it. It's already happening. And um, yeah, this is very small, admittedly, compared to what we can expect from uh, climate change. Um, for me, is leading is the Club of Rome. Um, I've been working for Wouter van Dieren, a member of the Club of Rome, and you will remember that the Club of Rome brought the fir their first report, Limits to Growth, out in 1972, and he was the one bringing it out. So I've been working with him for eight years, and for me, the report stating that in 2027, 20, maybe 2030, um, we will hit the limits of growth is leading. So I expect that indeed, um, uh, as uh, Rebecca was already saying, in a few years we will experience that everything is finite, even more than now. Um, the temperature can rise maybe to six degrees. So for me, this is urgency, but no more than that. Um, I'm very optimistic and uh, Ecopreneur is, uh, is working on solutions. And one of my fa favorite thoughts is that if everything now is growing as exponentially into the limits, uh, also, our capacity to find solutions is, uh, can happen uh, exponentially. So, uh, the whole idea is to do advocacy in projects to create, as fast as possible, a low-carbon circular economy. So, um, what I want to say is a few things, because I, because I can speak about this for hours. Uh, first, um, um, Ecopreneur represents these SMEs and they are very important. Many people think about, okay, let's talk to the big companies because we need scale or we need it fast, like uh, companies like Unilever. And indeed, they want to move forward. But if you look at the most innovative food companies as SMEs, they are way, way ahead of Unilever. And this is true for every market. The real solution leaders are SMEs. And um, that's why I started working with them a few years ago. And as it turns out, in 2013 already, I think I started asking everybody uh, from these companies, what is keeping you from doing low carbon circular business? So we've developed a whole list of barriers. And this has been all, by the way, been extensively researched by others, confirmed. And the main problem, and this is something I would like to also discuss with you, is the a lack of demand pool for low carbon circular products and services. So I think Rebecca, what I told you at the bank that there's no demand, that's, that's to a large extent is true. Our companies are successful because they have found niches where there is demand and they're also working their butts off and, 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 and kind of hacking the linear system to get through and to make some profit. Um, so that's the first one that we need to tackle, create demand. The second is a lack of transparency. And that is why I'm so interested in this task force because a lack of transparency through the value chain is hurdle number two. But there's very little that I've been able to do uh, on the advocacy side during the last uh, four years. The third one is access to funding. So that's another reason to be interested here. And, uh, and the fourth is complexity of circular design. And there are many others, but it's not maybe relevant to go into that now. So 
what can we do to accelerate our journey towards a green economy before it's too late was one of the questions for today. And my answer to that in short version is simply sim systems change. We need to change the entire, entire system. Um, so what you're all, some of you are working on is like ESG. I mean, that's very important because systems change is happening too slow, but we need to change the econo economic system. For instance, if you just start changing the finance system and you make funding more available and you steer it toward more towards sustainability, you still haven't created the demand. For that, we need true pricing by economic incentives to create a circular market. Otherwise, you will lose your money. You will not have return on, on investment. Now, a lot of good things are happening this year, um, accelerated, I think, to a large extent by COVID, although the investment money is, is uh, evaporating before your eyes. But um, first of all, there is a green recovery plan for Europe. And an and ecopreneur welcomes that. Uh, also, there is now an SME strategy. There is a circular economy action plan. They're all going through with that. Um, so we welcome that. Um, and we also welcome their overall ambition, uh, the emphasis on green public procurement, scaling up front runners, also transparency, a European data space for smart circular apl applications. This can lead to uh, materials and products passports. So a lot is going well, but we want green strings attached to 100% of the EU budget and of state aid, because now it's going to airlines. Um, and we also want to support that there is indeed support for the private sector, but that it also goes to SMEs, because now we see that the SMEs are not helped in the same amounts at all as multinationals, and we want to avoid any lock-in into the old fossil economy. Now, what else? Um, so the plan, overall plan, we think is good from Timmermans and von der Leyen, but how to implement, um, and they should not be um, afraid that industry will not adapt because industry will adapt. But unfortunately, the ambitions are good, but we have analyzed the policy measures and also Janusz Potocznik has done the same. And he also concludes that the, the policy measures are simply inadequate to reach the goals. Um, so if they implement this plan, I think that some circularity will occur, occur and some CO2 will not be emitted, but we will not create a systems change to a low carbon circular economy. Now, there are four things I want to mention um, that, that we think are missing. And the first one is to enable the full potential of SMEs. And for that, we want circular acceleration houses in all regions uh, to, to engage them as front runners to, to create a race to the top. Um, and also, um, uh, other some other measures for the SMEs. Then the second thing that we miss are the economic incentives. Now in recent drafts, I do see EPR, extended producer responsibility schemes appearing again, fortunately, because that is a price incentive that works. And if you can do that with so-called equal modulation, then you can create true pricing and you can create a market. That's a systems change. Um, we also would like to implement green and circular procurement um, and also ensuring good access again for SMEs. Very important also to create a good market in Europe is to create a, an effective carbon border adjustment mechanism. This already has an abbre abbreviation CBAM. And this is to, because we now have a completely unfair market. Our 3000 SMEs are constantly suffering from unfair competition from China and other regions of the world with cheap, not very um, um, sustainable products. So this is unfair and should be yeah, uh, corrected with a price correction at the border. Well, what else shall I mention here? Yeah, the financial taxonomy, it's not finished. Um, it's not only limited to do no harm, but also the circular and the social dimension have not been integrated. It's just focusing on climate. Although my final thing that I would like to mention here, yeah, innovation funding and subsidies need to be uh, also increased. And then a lot of legislation should be uh, implemented, including, this is linked to transparency, 
a mandatory gate-to-gate -gate life cycle analysis for all companies, also for SMEs. We've discussed this internally and we think this is feasible and we are SMEs. Um, so if all the SMEs in Europe, maybe with, yeah, taking care maybe of the smallest one, but um, if they all make their own gates to gate life cycle analysis, we have all the data. You can add them up and you can find out what the total product environmental footprint will be and social one. So, um, yeah, some kind, some, some, some last remarks I would like to uh, make is so, first of all, the question was what role can the financial services sector play in helping to avoid the climate catastrophe? Well, that is increased access to finance for SMEs, include this circular social dimension in the taxonomy, um, improve access to finance at the regional level by circular acceleration houses, um, uh, also, uh, have an extra SME impact assessment at the end of each EU policy trajectory because in 2019 the taxonomy proposal also, almost went completely wrong for green SMEs. And all this is important, like I said, to create markets uh, and to avoid a lack of return on investment. Um, and then there was a question about uh, if COVID-19 will be good or bad news for the planet Earth. Well, I feel it's like a wake-up call. Um, a disadvantage is that I see that there is now already less capital available to invest, but there is more urgency. Um, and also, <laughs> I already referred to a blog I posted Saturday um, on my LinkedIn page and on my webpage, is that the Western Empire did uh, sorry, the Western Roman Empire 2000 years ago, 1500 years ago, did in the end not survive the Antonine Plague. It was far worse than COVID. Um, but we are facing this climate, uh, cl climate change problem and potentially more plagues. So we should really take it seriously um, and because climate is a real urgency. Okay. I think that's uh, that's it for now. If if there are any questions, Arthur, thank you very much indeed for sharing those thoughts. It is amazing how many different things that you and your colleagues are involved with. It really is impressive stuff, Arthur. Thank you, thank you very very much. Um, I, I've never heard of the carbon board adjustment mechanism before, but it, I, I I get it conceptually. It'll be interesting to know a bit more about that. If you wouldn't mind, please mm -hmm. put into the chat a link to where we can find out more about this, because the 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 measurement of the carbon differential between different borders is a is going to become an increasingly interesting topic. Thank you, Arthur. We're going to go. Yes. Thank you very much. We're going to go to uh, Q and A. Any initial comments or questions for Arthur? Before we go back to Julian, who, whose internet connection broke earlier. Is Julian back with us? Looks like he might have gone again, unfortunately. Oh, there he is. Oh, there, lovely, lovely. Does anybody have anything for Arthur? In which case, um, you've stunned us into silence, Arthur. We're going to wave like six-year-olds <laughs> to thank you for your session. Thank you very, very much indeed. Great stuff. Uh, please do put some information in there about the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Very much appreciate you being with us this evening, Arthur. Thank you. We're going to go straight to Julian, who within the next eight, nine, ten minutes or so is going to share with us his thoughts. We then got Stefan, a very quick uh, one minute round from Stefan. That will probably take us through to eight o'clock. I will keep the channel open till up to 8.30 if people want to chat afterwards in kind of far side chat mode. Um, uh, Julian, over to you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Um, oh, I'm actually going to well. stop my video feed, which may help preserve my connection. Um, and share screen, if I may. Right, <clears throat> you should be on the see a slide headed city regional view. Yep. Yes, we can. Perfect. Thumbs up. Yep. Yeah, I've uh, deliberately said um, zero carbon society, and I want to come back to that point uh, shortly. Um, the context of this is that Birmingham and many other authorities, somewhere between 250 and 300, the last time I looked in uh, England, I think, um, have declared a climate emergency. Um, unfortunately, the sense of urgency has been uh, somewhat lacking. 
Um, but what follows is a perspective, personal perspective from what I like to think of as something near the front line. Um, so, why is that not moving? There we go. Right, we're talking about investment in the just transition. I don't want to dwell on the definition of that, but it's moving to net zero carbon whilst not harming people in essence. Um, so what's, what's the money for? Um, what's our purpose in spending it? Where's it coming from? Where's it going? How much do we need at a regional level? And how on earth are we gonna do this in the short time available? That's what I'm hoping to rattle through in the next few minutes. Um, what's it for? We have got to spend some money on hundreds, maybe thousands of projects and initiatives in different areas like energy and housing and so on. We need to invest in mitigation and adaptation. A few people have mentioned dire consequences, especially for poor and vulnerable communities. And that's happening right now in our city and region. Um, obviously it's far worse in some areas of the world, but that effect is gonna spread as the temperature continues to rise. Um, the project activities and outputs are gonna vary quite widely. And I, from where I'm coming from, a just transition must be a lot more than just replacing fossil energy with renewables. There is a school of thought that tech will save us and we just want the energy substitution. Well, I'm, I'm not in that space. Um, <clears throat> the projects only produce outputs, so they do stuff. And um, we've got to work really hard to leverage those outputs to deliver benefits and ultimately achieve the impact that we seek, which is a just transition to a sustainable society. And that's through the lens of, you know, local communities and cities and regional um, perspective. And in a relatively deprived city like Birmingham, the climate action has got to support other short-term local priorities. You can't abandon those and you won't get buy-in unless you do address those. So for example, on transport, if you promote electric vehicles and install more charging points, that's all well and good. But investing in better, more affordable public transport would benefit more people and it would cut traffic emissions much faster. These are difficult choices and who's going to make them? What criteria are they going to use to make those decisions? Um, Personally, I, I can't see how the economic and political systems which caused the climate and ecological emergency in the first place can support a just transition. We've got to basically change the rules and that changing values, changing purpose, changing relationships. Various people have mentioned systems change tonight and I'd refer you to Donella Meadows' list of where to intervene in a system, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the Bible. If you want to boil my worldview down, it's um, systems thinking. And I, uh, I read Limits to Growth in about 1974 and it changed my life. Um, this is fundamental stuff we're talking about. And I think what we've been talking about today is a sign of the times in terms of these merging of the Venn diagrams until we get to a point where the economy is the servant of society and is consistent with environmental limits as per the donut, rather than dictating what happens in the short term at least. So there are many perspectives on this and like the donut economy, like the circular economy, the, the key question is how can we influence the people and institutions which run and benefit from the status quo to change to new ways of thinking and new ways of working? And we've had various suggestions on that so far. Um, this has come up before as well. I'm really glad about that because it proves we're all kind of thinking along the same lines. Um, uh, this is an alternative perspective on investment. And we're talking about a wide range of differences in attitudes to risk and reward from owners of private capital. Now, the, I'm not a finance expert, far from it. And, I tend to think, you know, my, tr my trad model is at the left end where, and I've done tons of business cases in my professional life in the public sector. You have to invest to get a return, either finance or finance equivalent. At the 
far right end, not the far right, the right hand end of this chart, you've got complete loss of capital and um, the charitable sector. But the impact economy in the middle is growing and maybe that could be a focus to create momentum, to get stuff moving at local level where um, the, the, the sources of capital are not so worried about immediate financial return. Um, there are many potential sources of finance and I've tried to list a few examples on the left hand side of this chart and um, there's, there's a mindset in local business and local government that we're either talking about private capital or state aid, that's it, and that's not true. But each category that's listed there will have a spectrum of goals and expectations and criteria for investing just like the, uh, the impact spectrum that we've just seen. So one of the things that I think is necessary and might be something for TTF and associated networks to think about is a more sophisticated shared model of these finance sources and what they're like, what they bring to the party, what the criteria are and so on. And actually there's a meeting in Birmingham being planned as we speak almost in November to discuss some of this in the context of our local climate emergency plan. Um, on the right, um, I'm making a point, I think there's, there's actually a lot of money in the system which is currently going in the wrong direction. So there's a ton of money going into um, fossil industry subsidies. There's very little tax take back from pollution heavy industry, which needs to change. I think the, uh, the CBAM is an example of that, which is a border tax. Um, and um, we need to stop wasting money on high carbon schemes. I personally think HS2 falls into that category. We could spend, you know, north of 80 billion much better at a local level on more practical short term things. Um, the global private banks have invested circa 1 trillion in fossil fuels since COP21 in 2015, headed by JP Morgan. It's completely shocking. So, you know, systemically, we've got to kind of stem the flow and move that uh, flow of finance somewhere more positive. Um, who's involved? Um, there's a very well-known slogan in climate campaigning, to change everything, we need everyone. And this is what I call the petal diagram, and it's an attempt to map out the sort of communities of interest and practice and locality who will be involved at a regional level. Uh, so over 5 million people, over uh, 500,000 businesses, and so on and so forth. So this is huge, and each of those communities has got a different perspective. They might be spending money, they might be managing money, they might be receiving the benefits of the investment. And that scale and variety challenges current approaches to participatory democracy. So is it right and will it lead to a good outcome if, if uh, probably a few hundred people make broad strategic decisions on behalf of over five and a half million people? I think not. COVID-19 has taught us lessons on buy-in or lack of to rapid social change. How much is needed? Uh, nobody knows is the short answer, but um, based on Stern and um, various shockingly different figures about what the regional GDP actually is in the West Midlands, um, and whether that's a valid metric in the first place for what we're talking about, it's we're talking of roughly one and a half billion per year for many years. Uh, it, and it is that the West Midlands? Can I just quickly join that's, in? That's, that's my guesstimate of the West Midlands, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. I've, I've never seen an authoritative figure anywhere. That's my guess. And that's on top of what's already been invested. So the combined authority, for example, has a, a budget of the order of 8 billion, I believe. But And some of that could be diverted and, and spent more wisely in terms of the just transition. That's a separate point. So it may not be net extra spend. Um, obstacles, how are we going to do this? The, um, we've talked about sources of investment and there are multiple barriers that map to, you know, the many-to-many -many relationship between the sources of investment and the kind of barriers that exist to moving that into action. 
And I believe the finance sector call that the intermediation problem, uh, matching investors and their goals and needs to different initiatives. And that's the biggie at the moment. Um, matching at the moment is very labor intensive and it's done on a project by project basis. And there's little or no strategic joining of dots, which is a fundamental problem because it will lead to waste and delay in my view. That's my program manager hat on. Um, very big, complex, scary slide. I apologize, I'm rattling through it. I'm not gonna go into detail, but I, the point of this slide is that I don't think market forces can fix this especially if the rules of the game that we've talked about so far don't change. We're gonna to need to invest in a coordinated program of work that will span local communities, city and regional level governance, national level, maybe international level. And as I said earlier, this is about fundamental changes in how we live and work and how we decide what to do or stop doing. Now, conclusion I make is that Myself and many other campaigners conclude that changing the finance industry is certainly necessary, but it's not sufficient to achieve a just transition. And last slide, um, I've pulled together some sources that are fed into this presentation. And I also want to shout out to some of the people listed at the bottom who have um, contributed expertise and advice and ideas and are doing sterling work in their own. Um, uh, sphere. Um, wow. One thing I would say, if I'm going to add a final point, relates to what was said earlier and about supply chains and the role of SMEs and so on, the network of connections, gate to gate. One of these reports, um, where is it? It's the one, local wealth building, that one, third one down talks about the fundamental role at, at local and regional level of what they call anchor institutions. And there are dozens of them, big universities, big corporations, local government, et cetera, et cetera. And if they can re-engineer their supply chains to take account of climate and the circular economy, that will shift the center of gravity of the local and regional economy by a long way, because they command such a large percentage of the total GDP. Thank you very much. Julian, thank you very much. You've clearly put a tremendous amount of planning and preparation time into your slides and you've given us a huge amount of collateral to look at and 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 we've listened to it as well. Julian, thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, we're going to squeeze in, if there is any, uh, one or two quick questions before we move on to Stefan, uh, who's going to have a few words to share with us all. Uh, we're going to be finishing at roughly five past eight and then we'll we'll we will keep the channel open until 8.30 or half past the hour, I should say, um, for anybody that wants to stay on for a bit longer. So please do raise your hand or, or, or uh, wave at me if you wish to uh, have a word now. I think we're good. So Julian, we're going to wave at you to say thank you very much indeed to you. Thank you, Julian, very, very much. And we're going to go straight to Stefan, who's got about a minute. We have what we call the just a minute round. For those of you that don't listen to the Radio 4 programme, people have a minute to speak, uh, ideally without deviation, repetition or hesitation, I think the phrase is. And those rules don't apply to you, Stefan, but just do share with us what you'd like to share over the course of the next 60 seconds, starting now. All right, rapid round here. So first, many thanks to all the presenters. Uh, there were three themes that jumped out at me today uh, from the presentations, and I would put them into the following buckets, human, financial, and environmental reinvestment. So what do I mean by that? For human reinvestment, we're looking at circular economies and systemic, systemic approaches that bring together humans us people with our environment, with our financial systems for the betterment of all of us. Um, and we really need to work on that. Uh, and I, it's, a, it's a critical component. Uh, for the financial reinvestment, there are two key components, themes that jumped out. First, the need for, re, the need for reinvestment of dollars that are made off of you know, dirty solutions. So we have been investing in uh, products and services and companies that have unfortunately done damage. Now it's time to take those profits 
and recirculate them into uh, greener uh, solutions that, that benefit um, all of us. And from the environmental perspective, um, the one thing I'll add here, which I didn't hear a lot of today, and that is greenwashing. I think data plays a very important role. Um, we didn't talk a lot about it today, but I think it plays a very critical role. Rebecca referenced science. I agree with her. We need much more concrete data to support the development of these systems so that people can't dispute them, so that Wall Street can't walk away from it, or you know, economies all over the world or, or financial markets all over the world um, don't just simply turn their back on it and say, you know, what you people are doing, you're dreaming. This isn't real. It is real. It's very real. It's in front of us from a physical standpoint. We need to make it now something that has a data component that can validate these actions, validate these initiatives and strategies. Sorry, Andy, I ran over a minute, but what the hell it was great stuff you've actually brought together the various uh, strands from the conversations we've done and uh, that was perfect Stefan thank you very 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 much indeed um wonderful it's uh, a couple of minutes past the hour um so does anybody have any final comments they'd like to make before we formally close the session but as I said we'll keep the channel open for anybody that wants to continue to chat away informally afterwards Sunil please do uh, go for it thank you You might be on mute, Sunil. Hi, Sunil. You're on mute, Sunil. So you need to you need to unmute first. Okay. Sorry. I'll start again. Um, I've, I've shared actually a, a short, a brief paragraph about 150 or 200 words, and you can see it there. It says there's a renewed interest in VUCA world. So that's the starting point of it. And because I couldn't get all of it in one go, so I, I put the other other bit of it next immediately equity among the people. Okay. So I think that's the focus on the ocean. And it clearly says that, you know, we, we don't have to, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, you don't have to withdraw completely in order to save the nature. The nature is there and it is very resilient. All we need to, I mean, there is typically it says $1 investment in th those four areas, such as, uh, such as uh, restoring mangroves, uh, offshore energy production, decarbonizing international shipping, etc., that can yield five dollars benefits in thirty years' time. Some of them, some of these areas can lead, yield up to twenty dollars of benefits per per dollar invested. Invested. So it's a question of wise environmental, social governance investments. I think that's what we have to focus on. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Son of Great points, and that's uh, those, those numbers are very, very interesting indeed. Thank you, Sonil. Uh, anybody else for any more? In which case, I think there aren't any. So what I'll do is I will formally bring the session to a close, but leave the channel open for anybody who wants to chat. Not compulsory, but it's there if you want it. Thank you all very, very, very much indeed. We've had some great input from some tremendous presenters.